Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, Assistant Professor of Communication and Media at Loon University. You can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm excited to bring you this episode. It's an interview I've been looking forward to for some time now, and that is a conversation with Jeffrey Alexander. He is a professor of sociology and co-director of the Center for Cultural Sociology at Yale University. And Professor Alexander is one of the world's leading sociological theorists, particularly around a paradigm that he refers to as cultural sociology. And cultural sociology, to paraphrase, is the idea that social phenomenon, even mundane interactions and objects, objects are embedded and packed with cultural and symbolic meaning. And so we can evaluate and study social phenomenon by unpacking the different layers of culture and symbols that are embedded in those phenomenon. So if we take political communication, for example, we can start to look at things like speeches and rallies and deconstruct the different elements of performance within those events. And that's exactly what Professor Alexander has done, particularly in his book in 2011 entitled Performance and Power, where he breaks down the elements of political performance into a number of components. And I'll just provide a bit of a recap here, and I'll have a link in the episode description to that full chapter if you want to read more about it. But if we start at the base level, we have the background representations that are eventually put into what the political actor will say, right? These things like the narratives and myths about a country. So America is the land of the free, for example. These background representations are weaved into scripts that are put into text by speechwriters that are then performed by the actor, or in our case, a politician, to an audience. And this can be in person, or this can be mediated through mass media, or today, through social media. And we can talk about a successful political performance when those elements become fused together, when the background representations are well-performed and received by an audience as authentic. When those elements all come together, we can talk about fusion. And fusion is a really interesting concept. We're going to start out the interview talking about it. And again, it's the idea that these cultural elements come together into a successful performance as a way to think about authenticity, for example. If there's a disconnect between the script and the actor or the actor and the audience, then fusion fails and the performance is viewed as inauthentic. So we can think about a politician like Barack Obama, who was highly successful at creating fusion because he was able to package these background representations into a script that he performed so well and was able to communicate an idea of the modern America that people believed in, viewed as authentic, subscribed to, and ultimately had a shaping force on American society. So that's fusion. You can think about it like when you're watching a movie and you forget that it's a movie because it becomes so real and you're wrapped up in it. Politicians try to achieve that feeling, but they do so in a way that is highly strategic. So remember, Obama had his speechwriters. He had planned settings for where his performances would happen. Not just in terms of rallies, as we'll talk about in the episode, but also everyday interactions. I think of the time when he invited uh, one of his critics to come and have a beer at the White House, right? These are cultural performances, and we can start to look at them and analyze them in their different components to see when and why they are successful. So that's just a short intro, a little background context before we get into some of these concepts. Um, and we can't forget about the role of the media, because the media is both a critic of these performances, and they're also technologically a broadcaster to bring those performances to people who are outside of the room or not able to actually meet the politicians. So they become crucial. And I was very curious to get Professor Alexander's take on what happens when these performances are digitally mediated. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll also get into Professor Alexander's more recent work on objects and icons and how objects can have an iconic form of performance where we ascribe meaning to these icons. And this is interesting because it's a sort of critique on how social science has tended to view objects as simply material and without this cultural or symbolic force that feeds into affordances theory. So we'll get into that. We'll also talk about how icons like 
political yard signs or MAGA hats can be looked at through a cultural sociological lens. So a bit of a long introduction, but I wanted to provide a bit of context. And of course, there will be links in the show notes so you can go and read more about these theories in depth. But without further ado, let me turn it over to Professor Jeffrey Alexander, Professor of Sociology and co-director of the Center for Cultural Sociology at Yale University. Professor Alexander, thanks for taking the time out. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Nice to be here, Michael, and looking forward to the conversation. So to start out here, I thought we'd revisit some of your earlier work on political performance before moving into some of your more recent thinking about objects and icons and kind of see how social media relates to some of these ideas. But before we get there, I'd like to ask you about the concept of fusion, which is central to the performance of both politics and objects. So could you describe for us what fusion is in your understanding and why it's a key component for political success in today's society? Well, fusion is a way of emphasizing the relative independence of both a speaker or a performer and the audience. At this point, not to mention the mediations in between, which are important. But a lot of work on culture, whether it's a study of architecture or nature or music or or whatever, it concentrates primarily on the articulation you know, of meanings. And that is critical, of course. And we could even say that people who produce these meanings have either a conscious or unconscious intention of getting people to see things the way they themselves see them. So what I wanted to introduce into the study of collective meanings, let's say a Durkheimian approach in terms of sociology, is the idea of intentionality. So I'm not just making a meaning, I'm trying to convince people. And that's where an audience comes in because then you're talking about people on the receiving end of these meanings, which they may or may not connect up with. And that's where the issue of fusion comes in. By fusion, I mean the kind of enfolding of an audience's understandings with the performer's projected meanings. And the reason why fusion is important is because as I argued in my work is that uh, over the course of human history in the movement from, let's say, band societies, small groups of 80 to 100 people or less, cultural action, has moved towards defusion, which means the separation of the performer from the audience. In a small Aboriginal society, the kind that anthropologists have studied for centuries, or that is the focus of Durkheim's work in his, in his critical work, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, Uh, the people who are performing rituals are actually the same people who are receiving the rituals. So all the members of the society are caught up inside of meaning, which means, in other words, there's no problems of communication. As we moved into more complex and more differentiated societies with the Neolithic Revolution, And we move up to today, we see that the process of communication is stretched out, is elongated, and immensely more difficult. So the the ability to convince others of the meanings that you're articulating becomes highly, highly problematic. So it's not a ritual anymore. In other words, in the conventional sense of of speaker and audience caught up in the same rhythmic, almost spontaneous movements. Yet at the same time, it's important to see that fusion does take place a lot. And in fact, you can't have legitimacy, for example, of power or legitimacy of, of any kind of action, whether it's a doctor, a teacher, a conductor in a symphony, or somebody running a podcast unless there is some significant fusion. And that's, of course, where media come in, because media mediate what performers do on the way to audiences. It's where power comes in, 
It's where scripting comes in, where mise-en-scene comes in, all the elements that I described of elements of performance. Definitely. And I'm, I'm going to try to give the listeners a bit of an intro into those uh, elements of performance. And I'll, I'll link to um, one of your chapters in the episode description so they can read more about it. But one of the key sites for achieving this fusion in a political sense is at political rallies, which you argue aim to become rituals or at least ritual-like performances, where you write that effervescence of the crowds flows into a symbolic political figure. But for a political rally to achieve this effect, there's a number of elements of social performance that you just discussed, that those need to align and are carefully managed by the campaign, things like the script, the setting, the kind of overall image of the candidate, etc. And you mostly wrote about political performance in the context of the 2008 election, when digital was just taking off as a campaigning tool. So looking back, how do you see these social media platforms factoring into the elements of social performance? You mentioned media, but is there anything different with social media these days? Well, let, let's first just talk for a second about the political rallies you describe. I mean, the early forms of cultural sociology, they always used the notion of ritual to show that there were still rituals in contemporary societies, which they equated with meaning making and solidarity. And my work is is directed against that. The notion of ritual is, is fragile, is rarely achieved, et cetera. So if you're at a political rally or you're seeing a political rally on television or on digital media, the aim of the organizers is to produce the illusion of a ritual with the speaker being a totem, totemic figure. But in the way that I want us to understand this, this is a highly produced achievement of symbolic action. So for example, presidents in the United States didn't have speech writers uh, until at least the 1950s. Whereas today, not only presidents have a whole team of speech writers, speech writers are scripters, let's say, but every important uh, every cabinet secretary has a speechwriter. Corporate executives have speechwriters, et cetera. Of course, the model here is theatrical performance. We have to see social performance using the conceptual tools of theatrical performance. Now, moving into social media, it's really interesting because social media is another step, in a way, in the diffusion of the elements of performance with newspapers uh, and then later with radio and then later with television, there was a very significant effort to connect distant members of audiences with performances in a way to fuse them. Social media takes that a step further and I think changes it in some important ways. Like the Obama campaign and the campaigns since then, they developed specialists in distributing via various social media platforms, the speeches, the performances, the pictures, the images of Obama. The idea is get it out to more audiences, create fusion with the, the script of the candidate. And that's that's from the, the side of the political performers. Um, and I, I want to return to that, but I also wanted to ask you a bit about this idea of from the user's perspective or from the citizens, where I think the, the things that we're talking about in the United States right now, whether it's um, Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement, I mean, they have this type of participatory element from a lot of citizens. And in some instance, because it's collective and that's where the kind of negotiation of norms and meaning making is, is happening along these issues, um, I wonder how you see that. Is that a type of collective performance? From the user side, do you see this collective participation around these normative issues as a type of performance, or how do you see it? Well, that's saying Black Lives Matter or Me Too, it, it shows something really important. A student of mine, a doctoral student, named Ann Taylor, has developed the idea that with fusion, audiences become performers themselves. That they're not just connecting with the speaker, in other words, but they're emboldened and energized to create their own performances 
along the same lines, but of course there's there's a distinctiveness and singularity. So what digital technology allows uh, more actively than before, although it was always the case that you know people watching television, listening to radio, reading newspapers, insofar as they fused, they did some of them become active performers themselves. But digital media empowers the audience or audiences, uh, first of all, in terms of criticism. I mean, throughout a presidential speech now, there's constant interpretation, criticism on social media that thousands, hundreds, millions of people are following at the same time as the speech, which, by the way, one of the important elements of social performance is criticism as a mediator of uh, the complexity between performance and fusion. And this intervention, I'll, I'll get to the question you ask in a second, but- No worries. This intervention of criticism from audience members, it could be positive, it could be negative, and there's both at the same time, makes it even more difficult for fusion to take place. And it more, explicitly opens up the pathway for polarization. But in, in movements, move, social movements that are importantly located inside digital communication, like Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement, or in the uh, February 2011 uprising in Egypt, the Arab Spring, these movements were designed to create fusion via digital communication, uh, social media, et cetera, for various reasons. I mean, in Egypt, it was, of course, because the authorities had control over traditional media of communication. And this allowed, you know, this is something that was an example that confirmed the kind of utopian ideas of social media. Black Lives Matter was maybe the first movement that was entirely, very strategically organized in terms of digital communication. Um, and it developed tropes and memes and, and icons and distributed them. And they could then call forth in a sense from fused followers, uh, these social gatherings. Me too, of course, wasn't really a social movement in the traditional sense. Um, it was a cultural movement entirely in terms of media and, and social media. Yeah, I was just curious to get a, a, a bit of your take from the, the user's perspective, um, because going back to the, the politicians, you know, when you talk about political performance, the apex of that is really the, the big political rally where there's a huge amount of, of turnout where you know campaigns work over the course of a campaign to generate that turnout. And that tends to make them quite formal events. Whereas I think we're seeing more expectations from politicians to be more personal or to be more like, you know, the normal user, for example, by broadcasting from their kitchen or giving uh, you know, behind the scenes looks at campaigns. And so I'm wondering how do you see these softer types of performance or trying to connect with an audience? Um, are they simply a means to an end to get you know, a following for the big shows? Or do they work to create fusion on a somewhat kind of different level? Well, as you suggest, Michael, these are ways to um, humanize the performer. And the, what humanization does is it says, you know, I'm like you. I have a kitchen. I eat lunch. I have, I have pets. Um, I wear informal clothing. So these are, this is a way that social media tries to intensify the probability of fusion. Of course, when it's done in the context of contemporary politics, it is highly, highly strategic. But the key to an effective social performance is that the audience can't understand the projection of performance as a performance. It can't understand it as strategic. It has to feel a sense of authenticity 
and attribute authenticity. And that's that's fascinating because it's it's the it's also what drama is. It's the willed forgetting of artificiality. So you can be completely involved in a play when you know damn well that these are our actors uh, who have memorized and are performing something. Same with a movie. So it's the same in social media. So in a way, asking whether something is highly strategic or not is, I mean, it goes without saying. All performances have an element. It, the question is, on the receiving end, the users, how do they feel about this? I did want to say, though, that political campaigning, at, at least here, and I think probably everywhere, it's always involved a lot more than just big rallies. There's something that Americans call retail politics, where a candidate just goes up and down streets, you know, shaking hands with people and going into their homes and kissing babies. I mean, there's a lot of, there have always been a lot of studied and strategic efforts at fusing with audiences or what I call citizen audiences. But I think social media opens up more opportunities uh, for staging intimate encounters with what Goffman calls the backstage. And I'm curious about that, because this retail politics, because I'm looking at some, some images from the 2020 election. And I mean, of course, there's a lot of almost every candidate is, is kissing babies at some point, and then it's broadcasted out to a... Uh, you know, to their Facebook following or their Instagram following, whatever it is. And I mean, how do you see that that connection? I'm thinking about the 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 big rally where, in a sense, the audience kind of has to forget that the politician is acting as a politician, right? Um, versus at the individual level, when the politician is connecting with a family or, you know, an individual supporter. I mean, obviously, or I would think that the fusion is much easier to achieve in person. So how do you see that jump from the individual at the retail level to the collective at these these big rallies? Is the fusion easier to obtain one to one? I mean, I think the fusion is much easier to obtain in face to face because you know that goes back to uh, a small scale society and face to face interaction. That's why I object so much to uh, a symbolic interactionist. Uh, perspective on contemporary social communication, because face-to-face -face communication is hardly the main central form of communication in contemporary societies. And that's, in other words, why we need drama theory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yes, it is easier, and that's why there's video of it, and that's why it's important. Of course, these videoed encounters with your average Jane and Joe, they will select out things that don't work really, really well, right? In other words, they're editing this video. But I think a challenge for a political campaign, just as for a branding campaign in modern capitalism, uh, is to you know, connect everyday lives, let's say for a candidate, to the ideological ambition of the campaign um, and to differentiate, meaning to create support for this candidate and antagonism uh, for the other. And big rallies play an important role because they not only create moments of intense kind of ritual experience, but they then are videoed or reported on in papers. And these are projected back to the 99% of the people who couldn't participate in them. And then they see the candidate as a totem. Yeah, super interesting. And I'd love to keep going more down this road, but I want to talk about uh, the performativity of objects as well, which I think is interesting in the case of, of social media. But before we get there, I, I saw one of your talks where you were discussing the idea of technology as a sacred symbol. So I wanted to ask you about that. And in particular, you know, in the early days of social media, they had this sort of swell of cyber optimism that social media would be, you know, 
bringing communities together, this democratizing force, for example, um, in the Arab Spring. But recently, it's taken a complete 180 into being, you know, all gloom and doom about, you know, tech addiction or disinformation, algorithmic bias, all these different scandals. So I was curious, could you talk about this idea of technology as a symbol of the the sacred? And since you've written about the 2000 Egyptian revolution that we touched on earlier, did you observe that narrative in connection with that movement? Yeah, I did, of course. And th- that was in the glory days of social media as a sacred and utopian material object. And it did work out that way. What I've done in my own work about technology is to show that technology isn't simply the product, the inevitable product, let's say, of science and capitalism, but that is something that has a deep, non-rational or irrational meaning as almost everything else does in contemporary society. One one ambition in my work is to break down the division between pre-modern and modern society and to show that religiosity with a small r, meaning sacrality and pollution fears at the same time, this kind of binary, deeply embedded binary and illusory thinking that this continues very powerfully in modernity. So, Technology from the steam engine to the to the telegraph, to the radio, to the television, and onto the computer, it's always aroused and it tremendous symbolic and emotional irrationality, if you want to put it that way. And I don't mean it to be pejorative, but it it's not just its efficiency, but it's going to solve all the problems of life. I did one very elaborate study of the emergence of the computer, for example, from the first announcement of the computer in 1944 in the United States uh, to the personal computer years later. And it's just amazing the, the polarization of the sacred and profane. The computer will solve all the problems in the world. I mean, people will be smart, people will be wealthy, people will be uh, enlightened. On the other hand, there's the Frankenstein image of the great fear of the computer. So when the internet comes along, it receives the same symbolization. There's these incredibly utopian feelings about social media because it's down to the individual, right? Because people will be able to proclaim their own enlightenment. There'll be actors who will get what they want. We'll all be able to communicate with each other. I mean, it fits perfectly with the kind of optimistic uh, enlightenment Habermasian idea It does do that in certain circumstances, but at the same time, its ability to create fusion, which is not related to something good or bad normatively, means that social media is a powerful weapon for evil, for demagoguery, of course, for spreading lies, for organizing violent movements, cult movements, et cetera. Yeah. And this concept of fusion is interesting. I want to ask you about that in a second. I, I can think of people being fused <laughs> to their phones. Um, but <laughs> connecting to that to the question about technology um, and moving into your more recent thinking on objects and icons, I know you've been working on this for a while, but kind of returning to it now. Um, you've argued that modern social science has mostly treated objects as material things. And in this understanding, objects create affordances that can be acted upon by human agents. And you seem quite critical of that understanding of objects as merely material. And I'm curious to hear more about it because affordances is a concept widely used in studying social media. So what's the issue with the materiality of objects and how might their structure be better conceptualized? Yeah, I mean, I I think that, well, there's been a whole movement in social science and in philosophy Um, and philosophy of aesthetics and otherwise towards materiality, as your listeners will know. And I think of it as one of the many, but one of the most powerful backlash movements against the cultural turn uh, and before that, the linguistic turn in the humanities and social sciences. 
So against the notion of discourse, against the notion of culture, there's been this powerful movement to say, oh, no, no, things are what make the world happen, uh, that they're so powerful. I'm sure that the most influential social theoretical argument about this is Latour and actor network theory. But there's also thing theory. There's This takes many forms. And you mentioned the notion of affordances, which comes from James Gibson writing decades and decades ago. And that's been picked up in sociology and all over the place, meaning that it's the material object that allows things to happen. It's rootedness in space and time that is determinative. And what I've tried to do is remind people of what a reductive concept this was in Gibson's work. For example, he writes, the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill, it implies the complementarity of the animal and the environment. In other words, for Gibson, it was a Darwinian idea of the utter significance of materiality, the role of the environment vis-a-vis -vis an animal, an actor. Yet people have picked this, this concept up and imported it uh, in various ways into a theory of social science. The way I see it is that an object has to be meaningful. It's material, but at the very same time, it's meaningful. And it's that meaning that allows it to be powerful in social life. I mean, a Coke bottle is, or a, 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 a Diet Coke can isn't, it's not, it's, it's affordance as a material object that gives it power. And the way that I've tried to conceptualize meaning in my icon theory is that a material object has a dualistic quality, that it has a material surface and discursive depth, but that that surface isn't just material, that it's always aesthetic and textured and so we bring in uh, the philosophy of aesthetics and understand that people's relationship to materiality is through their senses and through their, ex their aesthetic experience of the textured surface of objects, but it's also at the same time tied to meaning. Right. And if we think about objects you know, beyond their aesthetic surface, I think you call it deep meaning, then there becomes a performative element in a similar way that we were discussing before with, with politicians. And you've written about this in the context of cultural icons, where an object, whether it's a car or some national treasure, is a type of actor in a social performance. And here again, we have that concept of fusion. So could you describe how fusion might be obtained through iconic performance, through an object, and how that differs from the political performances we discussed earlier? Well, I, I mean, objects have power. So in a way, that goes back to this backlash movement, which proclaimed materiality. So no doubt objects continuously have power, but the question is what kind of power and where do they get it? I argue that they, they have performative power, the power to create experiences of fusion with the meanings that are the depth of these objects. And they do it through an attractive, a sensuously compelling material surface. I mean, even in a political rally, let's say, or a political commercial, the politician can be thought of, if you want, as a material thing. So it's not only his or her discourse through the speech, but the encounter with the material visage, the body, the face, the voice, the expressions. There's a a two-track, let's say, uh, performance, discursively and iconically. But in a more mundane way, let's take, you know, the BMW or a Chevrolet, let's just say a Prius, uh, which is made by, I don't know, not Toyota, but 
Ford, Some, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, Jap a Japanese company. But let's take a car. You know, an automobile is obviously a material object, and it is propelled by physics. And um, my theory doesn't deny physics. I mean, of course, material things are rooted in time and space, and they have a material force in that sense. But the main role that they play in society isn't really that. So a car isn't sold on the basis of simply, or even I would argue primarily in terms of its efficiency and power as a material object, but it's emblematized, it's iconicized, it's designed. There's tremendous amounts of money spent on the design of automobiles and on changing that design continuously so that older cars as iconic objects cannot no longer fuse with consumer audiences because their style has been replaced by something more fashionable. I think we can see this kind of cycling through of iconic fashion as a permanent and really amazing feature of contemporary societies. It's, and it goes throughout. I mean, of course, art of all kinds, uh, avant-garde continually redefine the symbolic surfaces and meanings of arts. Of course, fashions, bodies, but also all, all consumer items and even political figures. I wonder, this question just came came into my head. Um, I wonder how you would see that kind of bridging the two ideas maybe between uh, icons and, and politicians with things like bumper stickers, yard signs, MAGA hats, whatever it is. Some of these, some politicians, and this goes back to the, you know, the early days of campaigning with, with sort of mass demonstrations um, in Britain and the United States where people would wear certain articles of clothing to express their support for a candidate. Do you see any type of connection there between those objects when they take some type of politically expressive value? Oh, absolutely. I mean, these, these are the things you're referring to, I would describe as iconic ornaments. And if you put a yard sign down with the colors and the calligraphy uh, and other material representations of a party or a candidate, you are hoping that that object will exert performative power over an audience as they walk down the street, as they drive their cars through. Obviously, the candidate is not there. There's nobody speaking. So you're hoping that that object, the same way that colors, you know, the orange revolution, the, the, the pink ribbons, the, the uniforms, the hats, the mega hats of Trump. These are all iconic objects, which a, a movement or a campaign tries to make a material object into an iconic object such that when it's separated from immediate relationship to a candidate, will it be able to exert iconic power? Really interesting. Um my last question for you has to do with design, which is a key aspect of iconic performance, maybe more for a car or a painting than a, a yard sign. But um, the design of objects is critical for how we experience them as well as how we attach value to them. And that led me to think about social media design, which is interesting because while these platforms are meant to be visually appealing, they're mainly designed to minimize psychological discomfort by being user-friendly and provide some type of perceived value to the user for interacting with the service. And so I wonder, given the ubiquity of these platforms and the amount of time people spend with them on a daily basis, would you argue that social media platforms are examples of successful contemporary icons? You know, I'm, I'm really not in a good position to answer that because I don't really use platforms very much, just in terms of mostly news media and, and cable movies. I think that's your, that's your new invention in a way, your new, the ideas that you're beginning to work with. But I think it's critical 
I mean, let's just start with design. Design is really an invisible element of performance. The object itself is, is always thought of in an essentialistic manner by audiences, at least if it's thought of as authentic, meaning it is what it is. Oh, that's a Ford. That's a Chevrolet. Oh, that's, that's a candidate. Nobody thinks that a company spent zillions of dollars and uh, had all sorts of consumer testing to find out an effective design. But in fact, it's true. Everything in our world is designed or else there is a design attributed to it. Um, but even nature, uh, at least in our cities and villages, is highly designed, of course. Now, in terms of, of platforms, I imagine that they have to be highly designed, not just for ease of movement, because that's you know looking at an object in a purely technical manner, but they have to be compelling. They have to draw people in. You have to move through the different stages of getting to the story, let's say, that you want. The designs themselves have to tell a story. So, I, you know, I, would, I think that's something that's very important to study as we live more and more of our lives uh, on various platforms. It's, it's critical. Absolutely. I'm, I'm frivolously scribbling down notes here, but I, I think this is super interesting. And as always with your work, it, it generates some, some ideas for me and, and hopefully for the listeners as well. So Professor Alexander, thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your insights with us. Thanks for this stimulating conversation, Michael. I've just been speaking with Jeffrey Alexander, professor of sociology and co-director of the Center for Cultural Sociology at Yale University. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time, I'll be speaking with Tom Moylan, communication strategist at the European Commission, to talk about his thoughts on EU institutional communication, how it's changed over time, and what lessons might have been learned during the coronavirus. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Malmö. See you next time.